Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, September 6th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today. Netanyahu says there is not a deal in the making. So on Thursday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that there was not a deal in the making regarding a potential ceasefire deal with Hamas and rejected a U.S. assessment that an agreement was 90% of the way there. So he was on Fox News and he was asked about this assessment and U.S. officials said this um, either earlier in the day or the day before. They said that the the agreement was basically 90% of the way there. And when Netanyahu was asked if that was accurate, he said, quote, no, it's exactly inaccurate. There's a story, a narrative out that there's a deal out there. That's just a false narrative, end quote. So later in the day, White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby was confronted about why the U.S. assessments have been so far off base with Netanyahu. And that's just not in this case. We've seen this. This has been a pattern over the past few months. The U.S. saying, oh, a deal's close. We're going to, you know, Israel agreed to this. And then Netanyahu saying, no, I didn't agree to that. Um, And so, again, this is this has been a pattern. Um, So Kirby said, quote, I've heard what the prime minister said. I'm not going to get into a back and forth with him in a public setting, end quote. And then Kirby doubled down on the assessment that a deal was 90% the way there. He said, quote, so first of all, 90% verge of a deal. You call that optimistic. I call that accurate. That's how close we believe we are, end quote. And that was in response to a reporter saying, you know, you sound pretty optimistic when you say 90% of the, the way there. Biden said on Sunday that they were on the verge of a deal. And, uh, of course, Netanyahu just completely uh, contradicting all of that. Um, and Netanyahu continues that he will not give up the uh, Philadelphia corridor, which is on the Gaza-Egypt border, uh, which has been, you know, kind of the main sticking point here. And you've had Israeli negotiators and Israeli uh, the Israeli military say that that condition is not necessary. And it's been widely reported by Israeli media that Netanyahu is sabotaging a deal. But you still see Kirby and all them saying, oh, Hamas is the reason why there's no agreement. All right. So the next one here, U.S. families of Americans held in Gaza want the U.S. to cut a deal with Hamas. So NBC News reported on Wednesday that the families of American citizens who are being held in Gaza uh, are asking the U.S. to consider making a unilateral deal with Hamas that would not involve Israel. The families made their request on Sunday during a meeting with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and that came after the Israeli military recovered the bodies of six Israeli hostages, including Hirsch Goldberg Poland, Uh, who is a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen. Sources told NBC that the U.S. told the families they would consider every option, but said they believe a deal with Hamas that includes Israel is still the best approach. So that's what U.S. officials told these families. Um, And so... Uh, I just mentioned a little background. Netanyahu's been been sabotaging things. So, you know, this goes to show kind of the desperation from these families. Um, the fact that it's clear Netanyahu doesn't want any kind of deal. So they're asking the U.S. to do something with Hamas. And, I mean, realistically, uh, I don't know what the U.S. could offer Hamas um, that would get them to give up hostages that are leveraged for them over Israel when, you know, the thing that they want is is an Israeli ceasefire, uh, withdrawal from Gaza, and the release of Palestinian prisoners. Now, those are all things that the U.S. could get Hamas if the U.S. decided to cut off Israel, uh, to just cut off all the military aid. We know 
they would not be able to sustain operations for more than a few months. So the U.S. has enormous leverage over Israel, and, and if they really wanted a ceasefire, they could do that. But they're not doing that. So besides that, I mean, what could they offer? Apparently, this story from NBC says that the Biden administration put together a list of prisoners in the U.S. that Hamas might want to see uh, released. But, I mean, all the Palestinians, there's so many in jails in Israel that they want freed. Um, I don't know who the U.S. would have that they would, uh, you know, accept in exchange for hostages. So I think this is unlikely. But again, I, it really shows kind of the desperation um, from these families. And, and the common thing that we've seen from all of them is that they want a ceasefire deal. The parents of um, Goldberg, Poland, spoke at the DNC, and what they said was that they wanted a deal, that they wanted a ceasefire deal. When Netanyahu was in D.C. giving his address to Congress, a few people were arrested inside the chamber, and they were family members of people being held in Gaza who were protesting it because Netanyahu's been the one obstructing a deal. You know, this is the reality. Um, but again, that's just not what the White House is trying to spin. Uh, all right, so the next one here, Trump says that <laughs> Trump says if Harris wins, Israel will no longer exist. So former President Donald Trump addressed the Republican Jewish coalition on Thursday and claimed that if Vice President Kamala Harris wins in November, Israel will no longer exist. Trump said, quote, if Kamala Harris wins, terrorist armies will wage an unceasing war to drive Jews out of the Holy Land, end quote. He told the conference attendees that they should tell other Jewish Americans who uh, support Harris not to vote for her. He said, quote, they have no idea what they're getting into. If she becomes president, Israel will no longer exist, end quote. So this is the line that Trump's taking on Israel on the situation in Gaza is that Biden and Harris have abandoned Israel, even though, as we've been discussing on this show, um, for nearly 11 months now, the U.S. has been providing a constant flow of weapons to fund this genocidal slaughter that we see happening in Gaza. They've also supported them against uh, Iran, intervening directly to help them there giving them the backing when they escalate in Israel, uh, sorry, in Lebanon, giving them the political cover at the UN Security Council. Yet this is the line that Trump is going with here. And um, that Republicans in general, you know, Republicans that are running in 2024 are running on, we're the pro-Israel party, not the Democrats. So unfortunately, it's a sorry state of affairs, um, especially, you know, for the Palestinians who... Um, you know, what happens in November does not seem like anything's going to improve for them based on that. So um, in his speech, Trump signaled that he would provide strong support for Israel's onslaught in Gaza. He said, quote, I will support Israel's right to win its war on terror. We have to win and we will win fast, end quote. Trump also bragged about the steps he took to support Israel during his time in office, including moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing the Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights from Syria, which made the U.S. the first country to do that. Um, he said, quote, I got it done in 15 minutes. They were negotiating it for 52 years. Nothing was going to get done without me, end quote. So the former president said that Jewish Americans who don't vote for him should get their head examined. And that's something that he said repeatedly while on the campaign trail. He said, quote, I don't understand how anybody can support them. And I say it constantly. If you have them to support and you are Jewish, you have to get your head examined, end quote. Very similar to President Biden once saying, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Uh, Trump is basically saying, if you don't vote for me, you ain't Jewish. So this is what he's going with here. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I want to mention our sponsor for today's show. That is the Expat Money Summit. Um, so if you go to expatmoneysummit.com, you can get your free ticket to this great event. Um, this is the world's largest offshore event taking place entirely online from October 7th to the 11th, put on by Mikkel Thorup, 
host of the Expat Money Show and a highly sought after expat consultant with over two decades of experience. At the summit, you will discover why international diversification is a must looking for those for those looking to preserve their liberty and wealth. Learn everything you need to know about crafting your perfect plan B, how to quickly acquire a second passport, diversify your finances offshore, invest in international real estate, and get in-depth insights on geopolitics from world-renowned experts. Headline speakers include Dr. Ron Paul, Doug Casey, Scott Horton, Tom Woods, Mark Faber, Tom Luongo, and many more. Um, to reserve your ticket, again, go to expatmoneysummit.com. It's it's totally free. Or if you want to get a VIP ticket, and that comes with a lot of benefits, including uh, panels um, that a normal ticket doesn't give you access to. And I'll be doing one of those panels on the risk of World War III, because if you're looking to move to another country, the state of the geopolitics and everything is very important. Uh, but the, if you go to the link in the description, you could get $100 off that ticket. And uh, or you could put in the code anti war if you do it on the website. Uh, so expatmoneysummit.com, go check it out. Uh, Mikel is a fan of anti war.com, I've been on his show before. Um, and again, if you're interested in this show, there'll be a lot of interesting stuff there for you. All right, so uh, get back into the news here. Amnesty calls for a probe into Israel's buffer zone. So on Thursday, Amnesty International said Israel's creation of a buffer zone in Gaza should be invested, should be investigated as war crimes, since it has involved the wanton destruction of all buildings in agricultural land in those areas. Amnesty said, quote, using bulldozers and, and manually laid explosives, the Israeli military has unlawfully destroyed agricultural land and civilian buildings, raising entire neighborhoods, including homes, schools, and mosques. By analyzing satellite imagery and videos posted by Israeli soldiers on social media between October 2023 and May 2024, Amnesty International's Crisis Evidence Lab identified newly cleared land along Gaza's eastern boundary, ranging from approximately one kilometer to 1.8 kilometer wide. In some videos, Israeli soldiers are seen posing for pictures or toasting in celebration as buildings are demolished in the background, end quote. Amnesty also said the destruction should be investigated for the war crime of collective punishment. The group said, quote, systematically destroying civilian objects in retaliation for actions by armed groups may constitute collective punishment and should be investigated as a war crime, end quote. So Israel's buffer zone, this runs along Gaza's border with Israel. It accounts for 16% of Gaza's territory. And this is something, you know, I've covered. I think it, it really doesn't get the attention that it deserves. This is an example of Israel already taking the land from Gaza. Um, and again, in these areas, they're, they're com- demolishing all the buildings, all the agricultural land, completely flattening it. Um, and they've done similar a similar campaign of destruction in the Netzarim Corridor. That is the strip of land that separates northern Gaza from, from the rest of Gaza, um, and it, there they've, same thing, demolished most of the buildings there. And combining these two areas accounts for 26% of the strip. There's a story recently, satellite images showed it looks like they're building another corridor from Gaza City to Israel. So this is something, just a slow takeover of the land. And these are things that Netanyahu's not going to want to give up. Um And many Israeli ministers and lawmakers want to reestablish Jewish settlements in Gaza. And these are potential areas where settlements could start popping up. The Netzarim Corridor, there there used to be settlements there before the disengagement in 2005. And there's actually the Turkish hospital in this corridor um, that was taken over. a, A big hospital in Gaza was taken over by the Israeli military. It's used as a military base now. And this was built where a... Jewish settlement used to be located and we've seen some of the soldiers there, you know, kind of doing things to show to kind of hint at bringing back the settlements. In one case, they brought a menorah there that was they say was the menorah, um, a menorah that was removed from the settlement that was there for the synagogue that was at the settlement. And, you know, they brought that back and little things like that that they're doing to show, you know, we're here to stay. Um, So and they're you know, 
again, I, I think it's very clear that Israel does not have no intention of leaving Gaza, of giving up this land, and ultimately they want to conquer the whole territory. All right, so the next one here. Um, Israeli forces kill 17 more Palestinians in Gaza. So Gaza's health ministry said Thursday that Israel's assault on Gaza killed 17 more Palestinians in the previous 24-hour period, bringing the recorded death toll to 40,878. Another 56 Palestinians were wounded, bringing the number of Palestinians injured since October 7th to 94,454. Health officials told Wafa that emergency services are still unable to reach many casualties and dead bodies trapped under the rubble or scattered on roads. So Israeli strikes were reported across the Gaza Strip as the unrelenting violence continues. According to Al Jazeera, Israeli forces conducted an overnight raid in the Al Mawasi humanitarian zone in central Gaza, which has been deemed a permanent safe zone, but has been repeatedly targeted by Israel. You see the picture here. This is a uh, what looks like a dead young boy being mourned. This is in the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus. Um, Wafa reported two Palestinians were killed in an Israeli drone bombing in an area north of Rafa in southern Gaza. At least three people were killed in an Israeli strike near a school in Gaza City. And casualties were reported in a strike near the Kamal Adwan Hospital in northern Gaza. So the killing continues. 17 is lower than what we've seen over the past few days. It's been around 40, you know, all week. And then so 17 on, and usually they put these out Thursday, like in the middle of the day, and they say, you know, the previous 24 hours. So it doesn't count, you know, uh, always count the Gaza airstrikes that we might see reported that same day, but that came after they put out their update. Um, but I think it's just important to stay on top of this because it seems like Gaza, this, what's happening in Gaza is just getting so much less attention. Um and, uh, you know, when we're talking about the death toll, always have to mention that this number is considered a low estimate. It doesn't include the 10,000 people who are estimated to be missing and presumed dead under the rubble. And then you have the deaths due to indirect causes that some estimates say that can reach, you know, around 200,000. And that's in the long term. You know, we're going to see indirect deaths, you know, when you shatter uh, infrastructure like this, destroy all the hospitals, destroy all the water, sewage treatment. You're going to see deaths, you know, over years as a consequence of this, even if it stopped today, there would be many more indirect deaths as a cause of, of, of this, uh, because of what Israel has been doing. All right. So the next one here, most Israelis think that sympathy for Gaza civilians should be censored. So this article is from the cradle. And it says nearly 60% of Israelis believe social media posts showing sympathy for civilians in Gaza should be restricted, according to a poll published by Haaretz newspaper on the 5th of September. The poll was conducted in March by the Pew Research Center. 59% of Israelis, quote, think posts expressing sympathy for civilians in Gaza should be restricted while 41% think posts criticizing the government should be censored, end quote. So a majority thinks posts sympathizing with the civilians, that's it, should be censored, shouldn't be allowed to be on social media. It's really crazy. Um, the poll also shows that 92% of Israelis believe posts inciting violence should be restricted. 87% say posts expressing support for Hamas must be censored. And 72% want graphic footage from the war removed. Um, and obviously, there's a this the poll shows a big rift between Jewish and Arab Israelis. 70% of Jewish Israelis support censoring content that shows sympathy for civilians in Gaza, while only 18% of Arab Israelis agree. So 70% Jewish say censor it. 18% Arabs. Uh, only 18% of Arabs say that as well. Additionally, 50% of Jewish Israelis support censor censorship of posts critical of the Israeli government compared to 31% of Arab Israelis. So again, you see this attitude about the civilians in Gaza uh, among Israelis. That thing I, I went over yesterday, that podcast, 
saying, oh, if there was a button and we could erase every single living person in Gaza and the West Bank, we'd all do it. We'd all press the button. So, uh, all right. So the next one here, the U.S. wants to deploy new missiles. Actually, sorry, I just skipped the whole West Bank thing. Uh, the next one here, six killed in Israeli attacks on West Bank's Tubas. And I wasn't laughing at the story. I was just laughing at me being stupid and skipping it. Um, at least, this is from Al Jazeera, at least five Palestinians have been killed in an Israeli attack on a car in the occupied West Bank city of Tubas. And Israeli forces shot dead a teenager in the Farah refugee camp according to the Wafa News Agency. The Israeli military said on Thursday that three drone strikes hit a group of fighters that posed a threat to its soldiers in Tubas, killing a number uh, of individuals. In a separate incident, Wafa reported that Israeli soldiers fired several bullets at the 16-year-old Majed Fida Abu Zaina in Farah and abused him and prevented ambulance crews from reaching him. They say that they dragged his body out of the camp using a military bulldozer. The Israeli military claims that he was armed with an explosive device, but there was no claim from any of the armed groups that he was a member. You know, if one of their members are killed by Israel, they always announce it and, you know, have a big funeral um, for them. Uh, but, but no announcement about that for this 16-year-old who was killed. Uh, so according to Wafa, Palestine Red Crescent Society ambulances transported two people wounded in the Israeli air attack um, to the hospital, including, and they transported the bodies as well. So the death toll here, um, since Israel launched its big offensive into the West Bank, Last week, 39 Palestinians have been killed and 130 have been wounded, and this is expected to escalate. All right, so the next one here, uh, the U.S. wants to deploy new missiles to Japan. Uh, so Nikkei Asia reported on Thursday that the U.S. wants to deploy a previously banned missile system to Japan for military drills. So this is the Typhon missile launcher. It's a ground-based system that can fire nuclear-capable Tomahawk missiles, which have a range of more than 1,000 miles. And ground-based missiles with a range between 310 and 3,400 miles were banned by the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, that's the INF, which the U.S. withdrew from in 2019. The Typhon also fires the SM-6 missiles, which can hit targets up to 290 miles away, which is under the INF level. So the U.S. deployed one of these Typhon systems to the Philippines for military drills um, earlier this year, and China viewed that as a major provocation. And it was sent to the Philippines for several months it was first deployed there for drills that started in April, and Manila said that it would be pulled out in September this month, so that means that it could still be in the Philippines. I'm not sure. The Philippines said that China expressed very dramatic alarm over the deployment of the Typhon system. Chinese Defense Ministry spokesman Wu uh, Chan said the deployment, quote, put the entire region under the fire of the United States and brought huge risks of war into the region, end quote. So that was the comment from the Chinese, very serious. You know, this, they view these missile systems as a huge provocation. So Army Secretary Christine Warmuth, she said on Wednesday that she told Japanese officials the U.S. wanted to deploy the Typhon to Japan next. She said this was at a defense news conference in Virginia, quote, we've made our interest in this clear with the Japanese self-defense forces, end quote. Warmoth said that the U.S. would also look to keep it in Japan for several months. So same thing as the Philippines. She said, quote, our goal in the army has been to really try to have as much combat credible capability forward in the Indo-Pacific west of the international date line, end quote. So she's saying we want to have as much firepower as we can have out there. Uh, Warmoth claimed the deployment strengthens deterrence in the region and said that the missile system has gotten the attention of China. She said that there is a lot of potential for moving U.S. troops and equipment around Japan's southwestern islands, which are near Taiwan. So, and some of them, the Senkaku Islands, are also claimed by China. They have a dispute there. Um, so U.S. officials say that the U.S. is building up its military presence near China in the name of deterrence, 
that's the word that you always hear. But of course, these steps have only escalated tensions in the region, making a conflict more likely. Now you have China reacting and things just keep building and building up. So Warmoth and other U.S. officials are also openly planning for a direct confrontation with China, despite the obvious risk of nuclear war. I know I mentioned this yesterday, but I have a quote from her from last year. Um, Warmoth said last year that the U.S. was preparing to fight and win a war with China. She said, quote, I personally am not of the view that an amphibious invasion of Taiwan is imminent, but we obviously have to prepare to be prepared to fight and win that war, end quote. So, I mean, there is strategic ambiguity, you know, out the window when you have the head of the U.S. Army saying we have to prepare to fight and win that war with China. Um, you know, I mean, this is just very provocative stuff here. Um, so, and, and these missiles and, you know, these are the missiles. Um, we don't know if it's exactly this system, but the description kind of matches it that the U S is planning to deploy to Germany in a few years that China, um, sorry, Russia is really not happy about that saying that they're going to deploy missiles in response. <coughs> so this is really dangerous stuff, uh, that they're doing here. Very serious things that they're messing with. Uh, so the next one here, Putin says the Kursk offensive failed to distract from the Donbass. So Russian President Vladimir Putin said Thursday that Ukraine's invasion of Russia's Kursk Oblast has failed to distract Russian forces from the front line in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, where Russia continues to make steady gains. He said, quote, the enemy's goal was to make us nervous and worry and to transfer troops from one sector to another and stop our offensive in key areas, primarily in the Donbass. Did it work or no? No, end quote. So Russian forces have been making more rapid gains in Donetsk since Ukraine launched the invasion of Kursk on August 6th. Russian advances in August actually marked Moscow's biggest territorial gains in Ukraine since October 2022. Putin said, quote, the enemy weakened itself in key areas and our troops accelerated offensive operations. Most importantly, no actions are taking place to contain our off offensive, end quote. Um, so Russian forces have been closing in on Pokrovsk, which is a city in Donetsk, uh, and the authorities ordered civilians to evacuate from the city, and the last evacuation train left this week. More than 26,000 civilians, including 1,000 children, have been forced to flee uh, the city. So Ukrainian officials have said that one purpose of the Kursk offensive was to gain territory that could be used as leverage in future peace talks. In response to the invasion, Putin and other Russian officials uh, ruled out peace talks. However, on Thursday, Putin suggested that he was still open to negotiations. He said, quote, are we ready to negotiate with them? We have never refused to do so. However, not on the basis of some ephemeral demands, but on the basis of the documents that were agreed upon and inked in Istanbul, end quote. And he's talking about the Istanbul talks that took place in March 2022. At the time, a peace deal was on the table, but those talks were discouraged by the U.S. and its Western allies who encouraged Ukraine uh, to fight. So, um, you know, I think the fact that he's kind of downplaying Kursk is a good sign uh, that he's not thinking about, you know, sending sending the nukes or anything in response to it um if you look at kind of the zoomed out map of you know the territory that russia controls in ukraine and this area of kursk that ukraine is controls some of it and is fighting in you know it does look pretty minuscule to what russia has uh in ukraine i mean it looks very minuscule but so the idea that it's going to be big leverage uh, for any negotiations, um, you know, I don't think is really going to be the case. But hopefully peace talks do happen. Um, of course, it's not going to happen before November because to Biden and Kamala Harris, all the Ukrainians who are being killed right now, that doesn't matter. You know, if they're going to stop that and it might hurt their election chances, they're not going to do that. And of course, they don't care about I didn't mention the Russians. It's a tragedy that Russians are dying as well, of course, but I don't think it's it means anything to Biden and Harris. 
<clears throat> All right, so the next one here, uh, Blinken visits Haiti amid U.S.-backed police intervention. I don't know if Biden and Harris really think of anything. I don't know. But anyway, so this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is traveling to Haiti to show support for the U.S.-backed government and Kenyan police in their struggle for legitimacy, as the Kenyans have been unable to take port au prince from the gangs and paramilitary groups, the White House is considering changing the status of the mission in Haiti to a U.N. peacekeeping force. Blinken's trip to Haiti is an unusual, so this is according to the Washington Post, they said Blinken's trip to Haiti is an unusual attempt to boost the country's interim leader and deliver a message of support for a U.S.-backed international policing mission that has so far failed to make a significant impact. So after Haitian President Jovenel Mo uh, Moïse was assassinated in 2021, the Joe Biden administration backed Ariel Henry's claim to power. Under Henry, Haiti descended into chaos with paramilitaries and gangs taking over most of the capital city. In response, the White House and Henry worked out a plan with uh, Kenya to have armed Kenyans deployed to Haiti to take control from the armed groups. Uh, but the plan backfired. The gangs shut down the airport in Port Au Prince while Henry was actually in Kenya uh, inking the deal. So it was really embarrassing for him. Uh, and then he was unable to return to the country. And then the White House made him resign, basically, and then uh, supported a new you know, formation of a government um, headed by Prime Minister Gary Conil. I actually, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, C-O-N-I-L-L-E. Um, so under this new government, the Kenyan pol police finally arrived, but, and they have U.S. financing and military equipment, including armored vehicles, but so far they haven't made a big impact on the ground. Um, I think there's only a few hundred of them or maybe a, a thousand at most. Um, I think, so the U.S. wants to send more international forces to haiti and if you know anything about the history of intervention and and especially with the un in haiti it, you know um it's not something i would be recommending all right so that is it for the news for today please go check out our viewpoints one from nicholas davies who wants to kill and die for the american empire one from ray mcgovern conditioning americans for war with russia one from norman solomon knowledge is power Gaza war supporters don't want students to have both. One from Branko March Teach, Netanyahu is blocking a hostage deal. One from Gideon Levy, when six Israelis are mourned, more than 40,000 Palestinians. So please go check all of that out. Go check out our blog. Um, got the Ron Paul Liberty Report and Conflicts of Interest reposted in there. Uh, so that is it. Um, that's it for the week. I hope everyone has a good weekend. This week went kind of quick. I really had fun at the Ron Paul Institute event this past weekend in D.C. Um, I think they're probably going to post the speeches soon. We'll definitely share them so you guys can check them out. Um, not mine. The, the, I did the student conference, which wasn't recorded, but like you could see Mearsheimer, Judge Napolitano, Ron Paul, Dan McAdams. Uh, really good stuff. Um, support this show. Tell your friends about it share like subscribe comment follow us on social media all that stuff helps out i appreciate everyone who watches and listens i will be back in a few days thanks for listening